Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Health Essentials Podcast. My name is Molly Schrodes, and I'll be your host today. Today, we're talking about the newest age groups to be eligible for the COVID-19 vaccine, kids ages 12 and up. Today, we're talking with pediatrician, Dr. Kimberly Giuliano. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me, Molly. So just to get started, can you remind us a little bit about the vaccine, how it works, and which ones are available? Yeah, so there are two different main types of vaccines available right now from three different companies. So Pfizer and Moderna both have a vaccine that uses mRNA technology. What happens with that vaccine is you receive a small amount of mRNA that your body then uses to make a protein and your body then further makes some antibodies against that protein. The Johnson and Johnson vaccine is, uses slightly different technology where a portion of the proteins from the COVID virus are attached to another virus and that enters into your body and then your body makes antibodies to those proteins um, directly. Great, great. So this started out with being just adults, but we've now moved into children. Um, can you confirm for me which age group we're currently working on? Yes. So the uh, Moderna and the uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccines are currently approved for ages 18 and up. And then the Pfizer vaccine has recently been approved down to the age of 12. Awesome. Awesome. So um, was there any difference between the vaccine that children may receive compared to what an adult has received? So children currently are receiving the exact same vaccine as adults. Um, nothing is different in terms of dose or content um, so far for children. Okay. And no additional risks for children? There are no additional risks. Children are tolerating the Pfizer vaccine very similarly to the adults um, in terms of both effectiveness as well as the safety profile. You know, and speaking of that, I know for many adults, um, there were side effects compared, you know, some, some minor things, some more, you know, annoying things. Can you tell us a little bit about what side effects people have experienced and if that is a possible risk for children as well? Absolutely. So first and foremost, I think it's important that we all recognize that both children and adults can have absolutely no side effects at all. That happens. Um, I think we hear about it just because it is a little bit more um, of an annoyance. And with so many people getting vaccinated, it's common that people want to share their vaccine stories with each other, right? Um, so the most common side effects that we can see are a sore arm, muscle aches, fatigue, and low-grade fevers. And those typically occur um, several hours within 24 hours after the vaccination. And then the side effects are typically lasting about 24 hours or less. Um, so mild, minor annoyances compared to the alternative with a COVID disease causing much more severe symptoms and lasting much longer. Absolutely. So how would you recommend parents prepare their child for the vaccine? Is there anything like giving them Tylenol in advance that you would suggest? So I would not recommend giving Tylenol in advance. Um, Tylenol does lower your antibody response. And so in order for the vaccine to be most efficacious, it's best if we don't interfere with what our body is doing. Now, that being said, if you get to the point that you're developing side effects and they're more than just a little annoying, um, it's completely fine to go ahead and use a medication like Tylenol to help alleviate some of those symptoms. Taking a step back, I really think the best way to prepare a child for the vaccine is to let them know what to expect. Um, share your own vaccine story with them share with them the importance of um, the vaccine, how it is safe, how it is effective, um, and how it can help us get back to what we long for in terms of those normal lives. Awesome. Can you just tell me a little, a few quick talking points that you would suggest parents bring up with their kids? Yeah. So I would suggest that parents tell their children that the vaccine is very, very safe. I think it's important that they hear that. Um, children hear a lot of the same mixed messages that we're hearing as adults, right? So if they have a friend or another family member who has had a different opinion about the vaccine, it's really important that they understand that what you're doing for them is designed to help keep them healthy and safe. 
So I would start with that piece. I would also ask the child what they've heard about the vaccine um, so that you understand where they're coming from. Maybe they're 100% on board and this conversation is gonna be very quick and easy, right? Or maybe they have some questions and concerns and then diving into what their specific questions and concerns are um, can be really helpful in making sure that you're making a decision that's beneficial um, for your child. You know, speaking of things that kids might've heard or adults might've heard about it, there are a lot of myths floating out there and common misconceptions, as well as, you know, it seems like we've moved very quickly through this process. Can you tell me a little bit about the research that has gone into this and the safety of this for our children? Absolutely. So the original studies were done on tens of thousands of people, and they met, looked to make sure that both safety and efficacy were there, right? And that's where we started with the vaccine. Um, Pfizer originally down to the age of 16 and um, the other vaccines starting at age 18. And then in order to get the indication lowered from 16 to 12, Pfizer had to assemble another research study of several thousand children. So not tens of thousands of children um, or patients like were originally involved, but they had to show us with many thousands of children that the results were similar, both in terms of effectiveness as well in terms of side effects. So it does seem like this um, 12 to 15 year group got approval a lot faster, and that's because they did, right? When we're adding on to an existing approval, we're looking at a smaller subset and just looking to make sure that that subset is responding in a similar way. Um, and it makes scientific and medical sense too. We don't really expect that a 12 year old's immune system is gonna be that different than a 16 year old's. Right, so relying on some data from closely related peers, 16 year olds, 18 year olds, we can feel comfortable knowing that that was all taken into account and what helped us to get the indication for the 12 to 15 year olds a little bit faster than what it took us to get it for the adults. So speaking of some of the myths that people might have also heard of, um, for example, long term effects of the vaccine like infertility. Can you kind of help us debunk those a little bit and explain to people why that is or isn't a concern? Yeah, so there is no problems reported with fertility. Um, and while I understand why perhaps some people came up with that thought in theory, when you really understand the science behind the vaccine, we can understand why that's not necessarily the case, right? So I think people hear mRNA and think of it as a genetic device, right? And genes are part of our reproduction and similar to DNA. And perhaps that's where some of the questions and concerns came into play, right? What I think is important to know is that mRNA is different than DNA. mRNA cannot get into the nucleus of your cells. And that's where the, the genetics live and breathe and, and stay, right? So if it's scientifically impossible for mRNA to get in there, I'm very, very comfortable with that. And then we can all be further reassured that after the mRNA has coded for that protein in your body, your body gets rid of the mRNA. You don't have mRNA floating around in your body forever. Um, so in terms of long-term um, effects, we assume that this is going to be very safe and similar to our other vaccines, because really what's staying with our body is the antibodies that protect us from disease and not these other pieces. And actually piggybacking off of the other vaccines, I was wondering, um, how does this interact with the vaccine schedule that children get normally? Um, you know, I know those are often grouped together by age group. Do you need to pick a specific time kind of to be grouped in there in that schedule or can the COVID vaccine be given as soon as it's available? The COVID vaccine can be given as soon as it's available. It can be given at the same time as routine childhood vaccines. Um, and if you got other childhood vaccines a couple of days ago, you can get the COVID vaccine today. Similarly, if you get the COVID vaccine today, you can get other vaccines within uh, several days of it. There's, there's no minimum intervals um, between routine vaccinations and the COVID vaccine. Is it correct that children generally get a more mild version of COVID? And why is it still important to get them vaccinated? So children fortunately do typically get a much milder version of COVID. 
it's still important that they get vaccinated because typical is not necessarily everybody. And so we do have some children who get much more significant infections, have much more severe symptoms and wind up hospitalized. Um, there's probably been over 15,000 children who have been hospitalized since the start of the pandemic related to COVID. There's an, also a syndrome associated with COVID called MIS-C or multi-system inflammatory syndrome of childhood. And that is a post COVID uh, illness where the immune system goes into overdrive and multiple organs are infected. Children with Miss C are hospitalized and most of them end up in the intensive care unit. So while this disease can be mild for some children, like a common cold, it's really those more severe cases that it's important that we help to protect children so that they don't end up with more significant medical problems and consequences down the road. Now, can you talk to us a little bit about the safety of unvaccinated children around people who are fully vaccinated, and especially as we're moving into um, the mask mandates being lifted in public spaces quite often? So the vaccine is very effective, and I think we need to have a healthy respect that it's not 100% effective, right? So the initial trials are showing us um, really high efficacy rates, but not 100% efficacy rates in adults. So it is possible. We have seen a handful of breakthrough cases of COVID in vaccinated individuals. And so if an unvaccinated individual is around that vaccinated individual who is unfortunate enough to become sick with COVID, then they can pass that um, on to an unvaccinated child. Um, similarly, an unvaccinated child could be carrying COVID themselves and spread it potentially to a, a vaccinated individual if that vaccinated individual is somebody who is ultimately susceptible to the disease still. So speaking of masks, as we are seeing a lift in the mandates of masking in public places, is there any fear or higher risk for younger children being exposed to the disease? So our health mandates are being lifted because the disease rates are going down pretty significantly right now. And this is good news, right? So yes, anybody who's unvaccinated is at higher risk of contracting the disease than somebody who is vaccinated. Although fortunately, if our numbers are going down, the chance of being exposed, at least through the summer months, are much lower, right? What we don't know about longer term is what this virus is going to do in the fall and the winter. I think that a lot of us are under the assumption that we may start to see waves again in the fall and winter months, similar to what we see with other cold viruses, influenza, um, and those types of illnesses. And certainly that was the pattern that we saw with COVID um, throughout this past year. We had a spike in the fall and we had a spike again in December um, and then towards the, the end of the winter and early springtime patterns. So hopefully with the health um, mandates being released over the summer, um, children are able to socialize and interact outdoors more so than indoors. Um, and then hopefully we have some more vaccine options in the fall and winter months for children when we're more concerned about the rates going back up again. Right. So if you're a parent and you have any doubt about your child possibly being exposed to COVID, you should still reach out to your provider. Absolutely. Pediatricians and family medicine providers are more than willing to talk to you about the specific health needs of your child and your family. Um, and any lingering questions, you should always go to a trusted medical professional. We're more than happy to help you sort through the science, the myths, what you're hearing from family and friends, what you're reading on the internet, and really figure out what the best decision is for you and your child. Awesome. So for parents and teens that are interested in getting the COVID vaccine, what are their next steps? So through the Cleveland Clinic, people are able to register online. Um, you can go in and click an, on an appointment slot and register that way or through your child's MyChart account. You also can certainly reach out to retail pharmacies, your local health department. Um, they all have slightly different uh, ways to get scheduled, but most everyone has an online option available to you. Um, in the state of Ohio, you can search on ODH's website, uh, Get the Shot, um, and that will help you find locations in your geographical area that are offering the vaccine. 
Now, do you know, is there any progress on when the next youngest age group will be able to have the vaccine and what age group that might be? Yeah, so the drug companies currently have trials underway all the way down to six months of age. Um, what I would anticipate is that probably in the fall, we will see an option to vaccinate other school age children. So probably the age group of five to 11, and then hopefully seeing um, vaccines available for preschool and um, infants um, shortly thereafter. Wonderful. Now, I know we touched on symptoms earlier, but um, should you plan on your child having the day off school the next day after the vaccine? So I'm an optimist. I would like to think that my children would be able to go to school. Um, and really, you know, in uh, if you stop to think about it, I mentioned previously, there are people who have absolutely no side effects at all. So we probably don't want kids staying home with absolutely no side effects. And fortunately, most kids have mild side effects, right? So if they're a little bit fatigued and they're arm is sore and achy, I think kids can go to school. Um, you know, parents are pretty attuned to knowing what types of symptoms warrant staying home from school and what types of symptoms don't. Now, certainly somebody who's running a fever, feeling really low on energy and has significant muscle aches, um, then absolutely, I think it's warranted for kids to stay home probably for one day in those situations. Um, but you can certainly talk to your child and, and or notify their school um, so that if symptoms start to increase as the day goes on, um, being able to bring that child home so that they can rest. So can you give us a few tips on how to have that conversation with your children about vaccines and getting vaccinated? Whether it's the COVID vaccine or any other vaccine, it's really important that kids understand why we're giving them the vaccine. We're not giving them the vaccine to be mean. We're not giving the vaccine because we want a poke or an ouch, right? We're giving the vaccine to prevent a disease, a disease that is far worse than the actual injection or the side effects that can come from the vaccine. And so I think it's important that kids know that. I've, I've often used the explanation for uh, any vaccine that the disease is typically worse, the disease typically lasts longer, and we don't want a child being set up for the problems that come from the disease and the side effects of the disease. We think that the vaccines are safe and that any side effect that you have with the vaccine is much better than the alternative disease. And it's important that kids understand that, especially if you're talking to an older child between the ages of 12 and 18 related to the COVID vaccine, helping them to understand that yes, while there may be some potential for some mild side effects out there, the disease is way worse. As we wrap up, if you could just remind our listeners why getting vaccinated is so important in your child's health. Getting your child vaccinated is the best way to protect your individual child's health. It will allow them to get back to school, get back to the activities that they enjoy doing, both indoors and outdoors with masks and without masks. So whatever you and your child want them to be able to do, this is the best way to be able to do that. It's also a great way to keep family members healthy and safe as well. Even if family members have been vaccinated, no vaccine is 100% effective. So we do still have small risks of vaccinated individuals becoming ill. So vaccinating everybody around them really helps to prevent the re and reduce the risk that we're spreading it to each other. So the more people that we get vaccinated, the faster we get on with what we want to be doing, um, both for ourselves, our family, and our greater society at large. Thank you so much for talking to us today and sharing your insights, Dr. Giuliano. You're welcome, Molly. Thanks for having me. To learn more about the COVID-19 vaccination, visit clevelandclinic.org slash COVID vaccine.